So hi everyone and welcome to this video on a continuation of our discussion in investment decisions uh, using the expected utility criterion. And if you'd recall in the last video, we discussed security selection. Now we know that there are two sort of decisions that we make, um, main a decision that we make in constructing a portfolio. One is asset allocation, i.e. Uh, which proportion of our investable wealth do we invest in the risky assets and which do we invest in the non-risky assets or the risk-free assets and inside of those decisions you could also have a security selection that is uh, which specific securities uh, should an investor opt to invest in or uh, opt to take so we went through a couple of uh, formulas in the last meeting and what we're what we're going to show at least in this particular uh, video is that um, all of these will converge to this uh, mean and variance representation. And these things mean a lot in the world of financial economics. So let's sort of recap what we did. So given the equivalence of the portfolio problems we worked on. So again, we said that uh, we could boil down a portfolio problem that looked around uh, something like this. Okay, we put it there. We can uh, think of it... Uh, uh, using rates of return. So given the equivalence of the portfolio problems using the raw amounts, which we start with, and what we did is we converted it into rates of return. What we can do is we will work with the utility functions defined on the overall portfolio's rate of return. So that's expected utility of uh, our tilde. And you know, if it's an overall rate of return, that involves both a risk-free rate as well and the risky rate, uh, the one that's used for the risky assets. And what um, this uh, theory will start to posit is that this expected utility representation can be further constrained to be a function of the mean and variance or the standard deviation of a probability distribution of the rate of return. So we can think of it as uh, a function of the mean and the variance of a probability distribution of R tilde. So we're going to posit this thing called the mean variance expected utility hypothesis. Now, what, what is that, right? So uh, the hypothesis posits that by looking only at the mean and variance, we are necessarily assuming that no other statistics are necessary to describe the distribution of end of period wealth. In essence, you could just look at the mean and variance and it would tell you the, the full story of it. And while that might sound myopic as to say to someone, it's acceptable that simplification of just using the mean and variance is acceptable as a working approximation, or it may be viewed as resulting from two further alternative hypotheses made within the expected utility framework. So, these things hold. The first is that the investor's utility function is quadratic in R, and we assume that assets have a normal distribution. Now, the, the mean variance theorem has its flaws, of course, and I think um, a lot of economists and finance people will generally look at this and say, well, assets probably don't have normal uh, returns and uh, for the, traditionally don't follow a normal distribution, and likely you'd be correct. But there are, of course, some instances wherein this is still true. So for our purposes, we will assume that assets have a normal distribution, that they follow a normal distribution, that their returns follow a normal distribution. And if the distribution of returns offered by assets in an investor uh, portfolio is jointly normal, then what we can say is that we can maximize the expected utility by just selecting the best combination of the mean and the variance, right? And essentially every normal distribution can be completely described by its mean and variance. This is something you know from basic statistics, right? So let's assume that the rate of return follows a normal distribution. So the rate of return follows a normal distribution, that's that N there, with a mean equal to mu R, and the variance equal to sigma square uh, r, right? So that's your mean and that's your variance. 
then you can write your expected utility as just that distribution you were talking about, which is if you since it's a continuous this a probability it's a probability density, you can write it as some form there. And as we said, the function is some function of the mean and the variance of the returns or of the rate of return. And that uh, this function here is a normal distribution. It right? follows something that's normally distributed. And this is how a normal distribution kind of looks like in basic stat. Now, what we often do, like if you recall how uh, a Z distribution looks like, it's essentially a normalized uh, distribution. Right? It's a unit distribution. And what we often do is we convert a normal distribution to a unit distribution, Z tilde, that will always have a mean of zero and a variance of one. So this is something that's typically done, like with a Z-score, uh, and we sort of uh, normalize the normal distribution or convert it to a unit distribution, we normalize and fix the mean at zero and the variance at one. So you can sort of look at it as Z tilde, which is again normally distributed, but since it's a unit distribution, a uh, normalized distribution, so it has a mean of zero and a variance of one. Then the function will now be represented by something that looks simpler, but again, it's just a simplification of the one that we had before, which is a function again of both the mean and the variance of the rate of return. So to convert a return R into a normal, uh, into a unit normal variable Z tilde, uh, Z tilde is essentially like R tilde, uh, R tilde, which is your rate of return minus its mean divided by its standard deviation, right? And note that uh, right, if, if we have Z tilde is equal to R tilde minus mu R over uh, sigma R, then this just simply implies that if you want to solve R, right? So you, you do first a uh, sigma r z tilde equal to r minus mu r. So if you want to isolate r, that's r tilde equal to um, mu r plus sigma r z tilde. So that's something that you can derive and that implies that. Now, if you take the derivative, okay, if you take the derivative of this rate of return with respect to z tilde, you're left with a standard deviation and you can for, further rearrange it into this sort of differential form here. And also you can conclude that if your function of the rate of return, again, it's a function of the expected return and the expected variance, right? The mean and the variance, then that's just equal to, uh, you can factor out one over, uh, not factor out, but it's just one over sigma r times the unit uh, function that we have here, the, that normalized unit one. So you can rewrite the expected utility as this form here in its unit notation. Therefore, the expected utility simply becomes a function of the mean and the variance of R tilde, which is in this case, this one and uh, that one. Okay, so let's discuss a bit about preferences over portfolio characteristics. So if you recall from our very first module, we discussed what C0 was, which is present consumption, and C1, this is future consumption. So C0 is present consumption, and then C1 is your future consumption. Now, with the consumer investing in a portfolio of financial assets with a certain rate of return, then essentially C1 is equal to one plus R tilde, or that's essentially the rate of return, times the total investable wealth less what that person consumed in the first period. So that would be essentially what was left over. And it's assumed that what was left over was invested into the into some asset, into a portfolio. And that portfolio has an overall rate of return of R tilde. Now the consumer's objective, uh, as we said before, in expected utility is to choose some level of C0 and therefore some level of W0 minus C0, which is what that which is equal to I0, which is what the person invests in either the uh, risky or non-risky assets or the risk-free assets. You want to choose a C0 that maximizes the expected utility, as we're still in the expected utility criterion. So we uh, use this for uh, use this maximization procedure, and assuming that 
r tilde is normally distributed with a uh, mean and a variance there, then we can write r tilde as something equal to this form that we derived here, wherein z tilde is a normally distributed variable that has a mean of zero and a variance of one. And if we substitute that into the objective function, we can modify the function we've had earlier as just this sort of thing. Note that essentially you're just saying that this is C1, right? And the consumer or investor can be thought of as choosing C0, right? The person will choose a level of present consumption such that uh, uh, choosing the composition uh, uh, sorry, the investor will choose a level of C0 and also choose the composition of the investment portfolio via uh, what it expects to be its return, mean return, and the variance of that return, which is mu r and sigma r, right? Uh, or in this case, the standard deviation of the return. And this is the mean variance criteria, okay? So uh, Copeland and West uh, show that for risk-averse investors, uh, these two things should hold. And actually, this, these things are obvious. If you derive the expected utility with respect to the mean, then in general, if the mean, uh, if the mean increases, right, then generally the expected utility would also go up, right? The expected utility would also go up. And that is because an individual likes expected return. They like more returns to get out of. So if the if mu r is equal to five, and then you're comparing it against mu r is equal to seven, then you would likely go for the one that's mu r equal to seven because that's a higher um, expected return, right? Now, if we're looking at it in terms of sigma r, sigma r is the standard deviation, and it's a measure of risk. Right? It's, a it's associated with the variance because it's just the square root of the variance. And if the uh, sigma r increases, then expected utility should go down because it's essentially saying that it's, it's becoming more risky, right? And an individual dislikes risk. As we said, the assumption that we pegged upon a consumer is that the person is a risk-averse consumer, dislikes risk. Okay? So... Uh, there are indifference curves that are associated in this mean and this variance space. And essentially, all combinations of risk and return that yield the same expected utility yield or fall along the same indifference curve in the mean variance space. Now, given the results, the ICs of a risk-averse investor can be plotted in the mean variance space. That's this notation here. And they will be one upward sloping and strictly convex to the origin, right? So um, how do we sort of explain this further? Well, one reasonable expected utility function commonly used by financial theorists is this number here. So you have expected utility value, which is an index or a number. A is the coefficient of the investor's absolute risk aversion. So this A here, this is that AW we've been talking about for so long. One half times A, uh, A sigma squared R is the penalty for risk assigned by the investor. Essentially, this is a measure of risk premia, right? This is risk premia. And mu R and sigma R are expressed in decimal terms, right? They're not in percentage terms at least here, where mu R is your expected return. Sigma R squared is the variance of that expected return. So uh, what you can see is that the expected utility rises in this direction when you go there. Now, for example, you have a point here in, uh, in difference curve three. Uh, in, along in difference curve three, you have mu three and you have this risk. Right, sigma three squared. That that's uh, that. I'm sorry, sigma three, not sigma three squared. Okay, you have sigma three. That risk versus, for example, I have a point here. Okay, here I have sigma uh, sigma two, and I have mu two. So look at uh, in difference curve three. It has a higher uh, expected return. Uh, and a lower variance. It has a lower variance. Therefore, obviously, this combination here will give you a higher expected utility. And that's something that you would prefer over a bundle uh, existing inside of the indifference curve EU2. Right? 
So that's something you would prefer. Uh, you would prefer over. So, and we can also see that the more um, the more the graph looks something like this, in general, the more risk averse the person, the flatter the graph or the more close to a 180 line, then the less risk averse the person is. And in general, that's what we imply about these uh, degrees of risk aversion. And we can sort of see that from the slope, right? The slope here is sort of steeper here. It is not as steep. And again, steepness uh, corresponds to our risk aversion measure that we've been, uh, I'm sorry, the curvature represents the risk aversion measures that we've been discussing so far. So uh, thank you for uh, stay, staying with this video. And uh, this is actually the last discussion we're going to have in the, under the module of investment decisions using expected utility. And in the next uh, sort of module, we're going to start to discuss the underpinnings of the modern portfolio theory. So I hope to see you there too. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.